Okay, let's open our Bibles to Nehemiah, chapter 4. And before you get too settled there, Brother Wright, let me ask you about that sermon you were telling me about. Uh, I mentioned um, Jonathan Edwards this morning, and really one of the most famous of revivals in the United States was uh, one that is said to have begun with Jonathan Edwards preaching that, that message, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. He was, he was reformed in his theology, and people there said that he just had a manuscript, and he just stood there and read his sermon, and people were so convicted I guess the church had gotten cold. I know that before, I don't know if it was before or after, he was voted out of one church because there's uh, supposedly a false charge made against him. And uh, in one of those churches, I think maybe the one he was in, it was just, he he felt like it was just the church was dead. But uh, uh, Brother Wright mentioned to me that he he had another sermon that was preached by Jonathan Edwards. What, what can you tell us about that, brother? Right? Fleeing out of Sodom is basically about repentance, leaving sin, and uh, turning to the Lord Jesus. I think he starts with reference in the New Testament of Jesus speaking about Sodom, huh. but he goes pretty much goes over every passage about Sodom. Application after application after application. Yeah. This is, this is a strong, powerful sermon. Probably a good one to preach today, huh? <laughs> Very good. Well, you folks know, of course, that the problem at Sodom was they didn't show hospitality to the angels. That's, that's the modern interpretation of that passage. They say it has, says absolutely nothing uh, about homosexual perversion. But that kind of brings up another thing that Brother uh, Robinson talked about yesterday is that people can't read in the United States. And they can't read what it says about Sodom. <laughs> and uh, it's even if you did have a question about the Old Testament passage, the New Testament references to it are very clear uh, as to what was going on there. But they were so corrupt in their sin that they tried to uh, assault, and I'll, I'll use a less descriptive word, angels. They tried to assault angels. They were wicked people. And that was inhospitable, but I'm, I'm telling you, that wasn't what that was all about. All right. Well, one, I was going to mention this, too. There's a lot of um, Reformed preachers, theologians, or whatever, that um, kind of look to Jonathan Edwards as a, a really key person, right theologically and so forth and there's some sort of debate and I think there was in his day about um, emotionalism versus theology being preached and it is true that a lot of the um, circuit riding preachers and and, uh, some of the camp meetings that they had just like camp meetings today have you ever been to a camp meeting? Okay. Shouting and things like that, people running around. You been to those kind? Anybody? <laughs> okay. Yeah, I went to Billy Kelly was the guy that played the drunkard on uh, she- a Sheffy. Uh, he's, he's a pretty big preacher. I don't know if he's still alive. I, don't, I think he's passed away. Come. But uh, I went to hear him preach in South Carolina, and there was a guy there. The spirit overcame him. He put a chair on his head and was running around yelling stuff, you know. 
And uh, Jonathan Edwards said that wasn't of the Holy Spirit way back you know, before. I tend to agree with him about that. Amen. But <laughs> thank you, Joe. Uh, but why be extreme? Why be extreme on emotionalism? I, I think that is a hindrance to the working of God. Anytime man's all involved in our emotions, it's very likely it's not of the Holy Spirit. But how can you have the Holy Spirit work in your heart and convict you of your sin and of the grace of God and not be emotional about it? So, you know, God deals with the whole, the whole man, and that involves our emotions, involves our mind, our will, all of that. But uh, anyway, people are different too, you know. All right, Nehemiah chapter 4. But it came to pass that when Sanballat, Sanballat, excuse me, heard that we builded the wall, he was wroth and took great indignation and mocked the Jews. And he spake before his brethren and the army of Samaria and said, What do these feeble Jews? Will they fortify themselves? Will they sacrifice? Will they make an end in a day? Will they revive the stones out of the heaps of the rubbish which are burned? Now Tobiah, the Ammonite, was by him, and he said, Even that which they build, if a fox go up, he shall even break down their stone wall. And then Nehemiah's prayer, Hear, O our God, for we are despised, and turn their reproach upon their own head, and give them for a prey in the land of captivity, and cover not their iniquity, and let not their sin be blotted out from before thee, for they have provoked thee to anger before the builders. What, what do you call that kind of prayer? Imprecatory, that's it. It's calling for judgment. Uh, verse 6, So built we the wall, and all the wall was joined together unto the half thereof, for the people had a mind to work. But it came to pass that when Sanballat and Tobiah and the Arabians and the Ammonites and the Ashdodites heard that the walls of Jerusalem were made up and that the breaches began to be stopped, then they were very wroth and conspired all of them together to come and to fight against Jerusalem and to hinder it. Nevertheless, we made our prayer unto our God and set a watch before, against them day and night because of them. And Judah said, The strength of the bearers of the burden is decayed, and there is much rubbish, so that we are not able to build the wall. And our adversaries said, They shall not know neither see till we come in the midst among them and slay them and cause the work to cease. And it came to pass that when the Jews which dwelt by them came, they said unto us ten times, From all places whence ye shall return unto us. Notice the rest of it is in italics. But what they've added there communicated, they shall be upon you. I'm just going to come from everywhere. Therefore said I in the lower places behind the wall and on the higher places I even set the people after their families with their swords, their spears, and their bows. And I looked and rose up and said unto the nobles and to the rulers and to the rest of the people, Be not ye afraid of them. Remember the Lord, which is great and terrible, and fight for your brethren, your sons and your daughters, your wives and your houses. And it came to pass when our enemies heard that it was known unto us and God had brought their counsel to naught that we returned all of us to the wall and everyone to his work. It came to pass from that time forth that the half of my servants wrought in the work and the other half of them held both the spears, the shields and the bows and the habergans and the rulers were behind all the house of Judah. 
They which build it on the wall and they which bear burdens with those that laid it, every one with one of his hands wrought in the work, with the other hand held a weapon. For the builders, every one had his sword girded by his side and so built it. And he that sounded the trumpet was by me. And I said unto the nobles and to the rulers and to the rest of the people, the work is great and large. And we are separated upon the wall one far from another. In what place therefore ye hear the sound of the trumpet, resort ye thither unto us. Our God shall fight for us. So we labored in the work, and half of them held the spears from the rising of the morning till the stars appeared. Likewise at the same time said I unto the people, Let every one with his servant lodge within Jerusalem that in the night they may be a guard to us and labor on the day. So neither I nor my brethren nor my servants nor the men of the guard which followed me, none of us put off, of our, off our clothes, saving that every one put them off for washing. The message tonight is titled, They Had a Mind to Work. Let's pray. Lord, we continue to rejoice in uh, our hearing of the plan to do your work that Midcoast has across the country. Lord, it's encouraging when we hear of other churches around us. Good to meet some of those preachers yesterday and to hear uh, that they are preaching and evangelizing and carrying on even though we we don't know of them that they're being faithful and lord what a, a great record of these people such a long time ago who had a mind to work i pray that you would strengthen us and give us enthusiasm and courage uh, about doing your work in our day Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. As uh, many of the other books of the Bible, of course, Nehemiah bears the name of its, author, its writer, its author. Uh, this man probably spent most of his life, if not all of his life, away from Israel as uh, a, a captive or part of the scattering of Israel. He was captive in the nation, the empire, really, of Persia. He held the position of a cupbearer to Artaxerxes. He was king of Persia at that time, which that means that he was a trusted attendant. Uh, you know, you don't want somebody bringing you something to drink who'd give you poison. But uh, those were not just people who didn't have a mind to do anything else, but were often... Uh, very close to the king. They would have been intelligent people, again, trustworthy people. But, uh, of course, Nehemiah was also a Jew. He was a godly man who had a deep love for God. He had a deep concern for the well-being of God's people. As we read, the city of Jerusalem, where the temple of God had been, was destroyed about 70 years prior by the Babylonians. And this destruction was by the judgment of God. It's because of Israel's apostasy. Talked about that a little bit this morning. And yet here is a man, cupbearer in the king's service. He knew about God's promises in the law of Moses. When we went through Deuteronomy, we saw the promises that God would destroy their enemies, but if, if they didn't stay faithful to him, he would scatter them. And this man also knew, no doubt, uh, the prophecy by Jeremiah of, of Israel being 70 years in captivity. Supposedly, Nehemiah was written about the 5th century B.C., Jeremiah a couple hundred years before that. It was just a quick check on that. But anyway, Nehemiah was anticipating he could count 
He was anticipating Israel's return to the promised land, the rebuilding of the temple, just like we're anticipating the second coming of the Lord, the rapture of God's people. Um, he's trying to add up and make sure he got the numbers right and so forth, no doubt. And he had a pretty good idea. In fact, in chapter 1, we read that he's praying to God. In verse 7, he said, We have dealt very corruptly against thee, and have not kept the commandments, nor the statutes, nor the judgments which thou commandest thy servant Moses. Remember, I pray thee, the word that thou commandest thy servant Moses, saying, If ye transgress, I will scatter you abroad among the nations. But if ye turn unto me, and keep my commandments, and do them, Though there were of you cast out into the uttermost part of the heaven, yet will I gather them from thence and bring them into the place that I have chosen to set my name there. And so that was probably on his, in his thinking every day, believing in the prophecy of God. And so by God's providence, Artaxerxes sent Nehemiah to Judah to oversee the building of rebuilding of Jerusalem. And of course they were interested particularly in the in the temple there. And this miraculous intervention, a guy like Artaxerxes, that was a great encouragement to the faith of Jews who had been scattered in judgment. However, like every true work of God, this work God gave to Nehemiah and others was met with great opposition. Some, occasionally I say this to people, but I, I mean it. I, I wouldn't want to be a part of a church that didn't have trouble because I would know that it wasn't a genuine church. It's really not doing the work of God. If you've got somebody like Satan and how many thousands of demons and you're not having any opposition, you're not fighting for the Lord and serving Him. Satan hates the work of God. Satan hates the people of God. And therefore, in the book of Nehemiah, we read that Satan raised up a man uh, named Sanballat. His name means strength. And he raised up some others. Tobias mentioned here, but others, Satan energized these people to seek to thwart the work of these God-sent servants. Now, the records by Nehemiah and, of course, Ezra were intended by God to provide instruction and to provide encouragement to God's people in every age since that time. The instruction tells us about the opposition that every servant of God can expect. We ought to know it. Most of the time, it seems like when people get saved, they go through this period of being naive. They... they now that they're saved, they think everybody's going to love them and there won't be any opposition. You know, life will just be happy, happy, happy. And then after they've been saved, oh, a couple of days, then they realize that that's not true <laughs> if they're paying attention and if they start to read the Bible. But instruction tells us about that. And, of course, the encouragement comes when we see God guiding and strengthen his servants to see his work accomplished. And that's what we have in Nehemiah. From Nehemiah, we learn that those people who love God will not, must not, be deterred by their own lack of resources, by the opposition of their enemies, or by the enormity of the job. But we must commit ourselves to building the house of God and, and get the job done. And so I want us to look at here first the overwhelming obstructions to rebuilding God's work, and then secondly the overcoming faith that accomplishes God's work. Overwhelming obstructions, there are four things that are pretty obvious in chapter 4. In the first three verses, we see the mocking of God's servants, our faith and our work. It says, when it came to pass that when Sanballat heard that we built the wall, he was wroth and took great indignation and mocked the Jews. And he spake before his, ser his brethren and the army of San Samaria and said, What do these feeble Jews? Will they fortify themselves? Will they 
sacrifice? Will they make an end in a day? Will they revive the stones out of the heaps of the rubbish which are burned? Now, Tobiah, the Ammonite, those all, the Ammonites, of course, were always lovers of the Jews. Uh, Tobiah the Ammonite was by him, and he said, Even that which they build, if a fox go up, he shall even break down their stone wall. I've never weighed a fox before, but I think they're pretty light-footed. But this has always been the case. And a lot of time, this mocking that, that we hear from our enemies, enemies of God, always seems to be uh, encouraged a little bit by alcohol or other things. But uh, these people have, Satan's always used a mocking or scorning as an effective tool of getting people to quit. Jesus didn't quit. When he was on the cross, they mocked him. They even dared him to come down. In Acts 2.13, there at, at Pentecost, when thousands got saved, there were some there were saying, well, they're, they're just, they've been drinking. Early in the morning, they've been out drinking early in the morning. These people are, that's what they were saying about people being filled with the Spirit of God. And in Jude 18, it says, in the last days, mockers will come. I mean, if we're not being mocked in our day, something's terribly wrong. They can't tell the difference between a man and a woman. They ought to be mocking the servants of God. But you know, you get that from family members. You get that from co-workers. A lot of times the worst mocking that we get is from people who say that they know the Lord. But that's just a part of it. And uh, certainly they, they heard it here. It's, it can be very discouraging. But we can't be thin-skinned. You know, we, we ought to expect it. We ought to desire to hear the praises of God and not be concerned about the mocking of men. We ought to have a mind to work. The second thing that we see here is the satanic haters of God. They were actually determined to fight against and hinder the work. In verse 7 and 8, it says, But it came to pass when Sanballat and Tobiah and the Arabians and the Ammonites and the Ashdodites heard that the walls of Jerusalem were made up and that the breaches began to be stopped. Then they were very wroth and conspired all of them together to come and to fight against Jerusalem and to hinder it. I mean, think about that. They're going back to rebuild a city and a temple, and these people were so angry they're determined to kill somebody. Kill them all. But this is another thing that Christians seem to overlook. People wanted to kill Jesus all of his life. Even when he was just born. As a baby, Herod wanted to kill him, one of the Herods. But then the Sanhedrin, the the most, quote, unquote, upright people in Israel, those that studied the law of God, those that were the religious examples for the rest of Israel, they wanted to kill him. And in Acts 13, 8, there is an example of that. Uh, you remember they had to let Paul, he had to escape they put him in a basket and let him over the wall in one place just so he could get away. Paul wasn't afraid to die. Now, these people are savages. And that's just like the, the, this hatred of the Jews today. The Jews are not even worshiping God, but they're, since they're called by his name, and they, played such, they are going to play, again, such a role in God's program, man... These people that he names right here, they hate him. Uh, in verse 7, it came to pass that when Sanballat and Tobiah and the Arabians 
and the Ammonites and the Ashadites heard, in the, and, uh, and he goes on. So he's named somebody from north, south, east, and west. I mean, there's, they're all around him. They've surrounded him. And uh, they, they plan to kill him. They do not want Jerusalem and the temple rebuild it. Um, they'll face that when they go out to Nevada. They'll ask you, what did you come out here for? We don't need your kind. I've had that said to me a number of, on a number of occasions. Uh, but it won't stop at that. And so they were haters. They determined to actually fight against these men of God. And they give intimidating threats. Our opponents know how to do this, and a lot of times you can't tell whether they mean it or not. Uh, in verse 11 and 12, it says, Our adversary said, They shall not know, neither see, till we come in the midst among them, and slay them, and cause the work to cease. And it came to pass that when the Jews which dwelt by them came, they said unto us ten times, From all places whence ye shall return unto us. That's all they said. From every place, everywhere you go, there's going to be one of them there waiting for you. You know who the most fearful enemy is? The one you can't see. The one you don't know where they are. And uh, I've, I've got a few acquaintances <laughs> that make threats to me or say things that are supposed to intimidate it or scare me. And uh, you can get paranoid about that. You might have somebody at work that says things that are, they're just intimid they're intended to intimidate. And the Bible says that Satan is like a roaring lion, and I'm sure that means primarily the fact that he could eat us up if God were not on our side. But from my understanding about the way lions work, you know, the male, they just roar, but they're not the ones that do the killing and the catching. It's the females who ambush them when the animals, when the food runs. And so we can't, we can't be intimidated by words. We have to have faith in God's word, not in the words of our enemies. And they did have an act, there was in them an actual willingness to kill God's servants. In Matthew 5, the Bible said, Blessed are ye when men shall persecute you. But persecution comes in all kinds of ways, but it does mean, and I, I'm serious this morning when I talked about praying for Mark Robinson's protection. Because you've probably met them. Certainly they're on TV. There's some, these folks are crazy nuts against Christianity. And uh, it's kind of been a marvel to me as to why. I mean, Trump, he's just like his liberal buddies. Before he became president, I mean, he was with the Clintons. He was with all these other people, the liberals and all these people. I uh, understand he's another one that doesn't drink, but he is around the drunkards and all that all the time. They're just like him, but when he just simply praised Christianity and took conservative positions, I mean, their hatred toward that guy is unreal. I mean, who could think he's a Christian? He's not. But just because he supports some of the things that are principles in God's word, they want to kill him. And so these are overwhelming obstruction. These are the kind of things, I mean, after being a pastor for 40 years, it doesn't take much for some people to quit. When I was first here, 
at Calvary. I visited a family, lives close by. Uh, they were wealthy, successful in business, and uh, just went to talk to them about coming to church a little more. And there's a father and son and mother there, and uh, right there in front of his parents, this son started attacking me because when he went out witnessing or passing out tracts with the young people at some point prior to when I came, that a guy had taken a trunk from, from, from take, a guy had taken a tract from him and just threw it at him and yelled at him. He was just a you know, young kid. and He was angry about that. And I don't know if he ever's been to, back, to, I guess he's probably been back to church, not here. But um, you know, whatever his Christianity was, it dried up awful fast when he had a little bit of opposition. I mean, they, they said that Jesus was illegitimate. They said that Jesus was full of demons. They said that that's how he had power to preach because he was demon-possessed. If we don't get that kind of opposition, how faithful could we be to the Lord? How much, how could, could our ministry be like his? And I believe we ought to be tactful. I believe that we ought to be kind in our words. But sometimes, many times, you just have to speak the truth. And sinners don't like that. And Satan doesn't like it. Men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. And we shine the light of God's word on them. You're going to have opposition. And you're going to have hatred. And here in Nehemiah, he had a cushy job, you know. <laughs> he just goes in every day. To, the most powerful man in the world, Artaxerxes, ruling over the Persian Empire, a vast empire. He goes in and takes him his, his morning coffee. I don't know if he drank coffee or not. They have, per they have Persian coffee, don't they? Yeah. Okay. Or, you know, and probably some kind of juice or something for his meals and, you know, maybe taking a napkin and dabbed it on his, his lips. You know, so he, he worked till he was bone tired, you know, doing those kind of things. But then he gets there and he has this kind of opposition. You reckon he ever wondered if he'd done the right thing? I mean, when, when the king said, what do, you, what do you need? It sounds pretty good. Something I want to invest in. I, yeah, let's see Jerusalem rebuild it. He said, well, we need, you know, these different supplies and so forth. And then he said, uh, no, I better not ask that. We're going to be carrying gold and stuff. And there's people going to want to kill us between here and there. But he wouldn't ask for an escort of soldiers because he had told the king, our trust is in God. And so that man began to live by faith. And yet, for most people, it seems like any kind of obstructions like this to doing God's work is overwhelming. You have a few financial troubles and stuff like that. Here they're talking about they're trying to rebuild the wall and all they have is rubbish. But this man had overcoming faith and he stirred up the faith of others. I don't know how many people heard these prayers, but again in verse 4 and 5, the precatory prayers was part of it. He says, Hear, O our God, for we are despised, and turn their reproach upon their own head. Give them for a prey to the land of captivity, and, the land of cap and cover not their iniquity, and let not their sin be blotted out from before thee, for they have provoked thee to anger before the builders. Somebody said, Well, is that the right way to pray? Well, he really wasn't like John, James and John who said, can we call down fire from heaven on them? He said, give them 
Let them reap what they sow. Return their judgment upon their heads. And they were hindering God's work. This was not a personal thing with Nehemiah. It was about people who were standing in the way of God. And men who knew the truth about Israel, but were there to hinder God's work. And they prayed for God's judgment to fall upon him. He did. In precatory prayers, there's a proper time. There's plenty of them in the book of Psalms and other places. In fact, when they voted in the first, uh, the second pastoral staff there in Acts chapter 1, they referred to an imprecatory prayer from Psalms about Judas. Peter quoted that as a reason to vote in another uh, pastor on the pastoral staff there. Imprecatory prayers are proper in the right time. And then, of course, and this is really what it all comes down to, there was a heart of God's people to do his work, verse 6. So, we, so built we the wall, and all the wall was joined together unto the half thereof, for the people had a mind to work. In other words, translated mind there is leave. That's Hebrew for heart. They had a heart to work. Their heart was in it. Uh, you have to question a person's salvation who's not, that, that their heart isn't in the work of God. They don't want to witness. They don't want to pray. They'd be willing to watch a ball game going to overtime, but if a sermon goes a little bit longer, they're not in favor of that. You know, we're busy. All of us are busy. Well, that's, who, that's the kind of people that do work. They do the work of God. They put that first. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. You know, you've got to have a church. If it's going to be a good church, you've got to have people who are excited about missions conference. They're excited about witnessing the souls. If you can give somebody the gospel and not get stirred up about it, something's wrong with your heart. For these people had a mind to work. They got there and they're threatening everything. And Nehemiah said, let's go get it. And they did. You know, I read about sports all the time. It's amazing what people would do, what kind of sacrifices they make, what kind of, the way they'll push themselves just to play, get ready for a ball game. And, and I, don't know, I don't know how many times I've watched something like a conference championship or a national championship or even a world championship, and these idiot reporters say, well, how does it feel? And this is what they say. Well, I, I, can't re I don't really know yet. I know that in the... <laughs> And what they're saying is, there's nothing to it. We won this big deal, but there's nothing to it. We ain't going to be like that when we stand before the judgment seat of Christ and are rewarded. Paul wrote to the church at Corinth. They had all kinds of things distracting them, but he said, Be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. Why? You won't do that and not get rewarded for it. You'll never waste your time serving God. In Philippians, <laughs> Philippians chapter 2, we have a, a good example for us, a guy named Epaphroditus. In verse 25, Paul said this. And you think about, you know how, I kind of think that Paul might have been from time to time hard to get along with. I'm thinking he wanted to push when it's time to sleep. He wanted to pray and stuff like that. and he wanted, he wanted to go back out and preach when the people wanted to kill him out there. But he said this, Yet I supposed it necessary to send unto you Epaphroditus, my brother, and companion in labor and fellow soldier, but your messenger, and he that ministered to my wants. For he longed after you all and was full of heaviness, 
because that ye had heard that he had been sick. Epaphroditus is all upset because he knew the people were concerned about him. For indeed he was sick, nigh unto death. But God had mercy on him, and not on him only, but on me also, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. I sent him therefore the more carefully, that when you see him again you may rejoice, and that I may be the less sorrowful. Receive him therefore in the Lord with all gladness, and hold such in reputation. What does that mean? Well, it gives the answer. Because for the work of Christ he was nigh unto death, not regarding his life, to supply your lack of service toward me. He's going to work till he killed himself. These people had a mind, a mind, a heart to work. The next thing, that part of their overcoming faith, is prayer that strengthens God's weary workers in verse 9 and 10. So we talked about precatory prayer, but verse 9 says, Nevertheless, we made our prayer unto our God and set a watch against them day and night because of them. And Judah said, The strength of the bearers of burden is decayed, and there is much rubbish, so that we are not able to build the wall. Here they are trying to do the work. They probably certainly didn't have enough resources and building materials. But not only that, there's all this rubbish that's been destroyed. You've got to get that out of the way first. And Nehemiah, he was a good overseer. He said, these people are bone tired. They're bone tired. But... They made their prayer unto our God. Day and night, they had to watch and guard against their enemies at night. They worked during the day. That is an extremely exhausting way to be. Well, how do you deal with physical exhaustion like that? They prayed. You know... Isaiah 40, verse 31, it says, They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wigs as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Ephesians 6, 10, talked about going forward in the power of the Lord. That's the way we ought to be. They prayed and were strengthened. They depend upon God. They also used properly utilized as lawful defense. In verse 13, the longest amount is given to this particular one, to verse 18. Therefore said I in the lower places behind the wall, and on the higher places I even set the people after their families with their swords, their spears, and their bows. I want to just stop right there before I go on. You know, there's, there's liberals all over the United States who, who've been liberal in their political position that have become conservative regarding the Second Amendment. People have been buying guns by the millions and millions. You know, we've got 300 million people in the United States or 330 million, something like that. And there's like 12 million, <laughs> 12 trillion or whatever the next one up, billion, 1.2 billion, let's say, guns in the United States. But these people armed themselves, and they carried arms with them. The liberals, they might buy a gun, but they're not going to, they, they don't want their children to see it. They don't want to touch it. They're afraid it might bite them or something. Have you seen people like that? Well, I better get me a gun because, you know, something, just in case something does happen, I'm not going to ever practice with it. It's too loud. Now, these people are in themselves. Their lives were in jeopardy. Verse 14, I looked and rose up and said unto the nobles and to the rulers, to the rest of the people, be not ye afraid of them, but remember the Lord, 
which is great and terrible, and fight for your brethren, your sons and your daughters, your wives and your houses. And it came to pass when our enemies heard that it was known unto us, and God had brought their counsel to naught that we turn, returned all of us to the wall, everyone into his work. And it came to pass from that time forth that the half of my servants wrought in the work, and the other half of them held both the spears, the shields, and the bows, and the habergeons, and the rulers were behind all the house of Judah. They supported it politically. They which build it on the wall, and they which bear burdens with those that laid it, every one of, with his, of his hands wrought in the work, and with other hand held a weapon. For the wielders, every one had his sword girded by his side, and so builded, and he that sounded the trumpet was by me. Everybody knows what we believe about this, but I think it's good to repeat it. We're not bloodthirsty people. We have no intention of advancing the work of God by physical might or force or threatening people or things like that. The Lord definitely warned Peter, if you take up the sword, you're going to die by the sword. But Jesus told his disciples, after they'd had this miraculous providential provision of God while they're with the Lord Jesus, he said, look, go buy a sword. If you don't have one, sell a garment and buy one. You're going to be out there traveling. I'm not going to be with you in the same sense that I am now. Everything's not going to be miraculous. You're not going to go and catch a fish and pull it up and take a piece out there of money where you can pay your taxes with it. That's not going to happen every day. And you need to prov provide for taking care of yourself. And here were people definitely in a situation where their lives were in jeopardy. He mentions this twice. Your wives, your sons, your daughters, your houses. He just goes to the list. If people aren't going to attack you, you've got to defeat them. And so there is a proper place for that. He's, we've already mentioned prayer twice, but there is a place for this. Um, and they, they did that. And then the final thing is what kind of reminds me of a church. There was unfearful, unified commitment of God's people. In verse 19, it says, And I said unto the nobles and to the rulers and, unto, and to the rest of the people, the work is great and large, and we are separated upon the wall, one far from another. In what place there you hear the sound of the trumpet? Resort ye thither unto us. Our God shall fight for us. So we labored in the work, and half of them held the spears, and from the rising of the morning till the stars appeared. Likewise, at the same time said I to the people, Let every one with his servant large, large, lodge within Jerusalem. And that in the night they may be a guard to us and labor on the day. So neither I nor my brother nor my servants nor the men of the guard that followed me, which followed me, none of us put off our clothes, saving that every one put them off for washing. You know, people use this phrase all the time today, but they had each other's back. They ran it together. <coughs> If somebody got attacked over here, they weren't going to run while they could. They were going to run to meet the challenge and deliver their brethren in the Lord. And we ought to have that type of commitment to each other. Our church is the body of Christ. He's the head. And if somebody, somebody in our church gets attacked or slandered or whatever it is, we ought to come to their rescue. In 2 Timothy chapter 1, Paul's writing to Timothy. And Timothy's seen some pretty rough stuff. And Paul says, God's not given us a spirit of fear. 
but a power and love and a sound mind. We're not going to fear our opponents. We're going to have a sound mind and we're going to be loving and trusting in, in our fellowship as Christians. We're going to support each other. And it's because of this, these people had a mind to work. They weren't ready to quit. Again, so often that people will be committed to school or work or, you know, ball, whatever it is, something they're interested in, but they get a little opposition at church, and uh, that's too much. I'm not going to put up with that. I'm not going to have somebody make in front of my kids because they're a Christian. But these people are not like that. At any moment, they could have been attacked. They had people slandering them, they had people trying to make them afraid. But Jesus said in the Gospel of Luke that we're not to fear man. We're supposed to fear our judge, the Lord Jesus, and God himself. So I ask you tonight, what would it take to stop you from serving the Lord? I mean, some people, they just come to church and somebody says something they thought was unflattering, so they're, they're not coming anymore. I remember years ago, we had this young couple that started attending. And on Wednesday night, we'd have about six people, maybe ten if we had a good night. And so, you know, I'm just a practical person. I was trying to save money. It was in the fall, I think. It wasn't in the middle of the summer. So I just opened the windows. And so this couple pulled in. They saw the open windows. They just pulled around and went back out. And then they didn't come anymore. <laughs> and that's what they told me. We saw, we got there and saw there wasn't air conditioning running. And they were mad. <laughs> uh, I didn't worry too much about them anymore. But do you have a mind to work? Jesus said that anybody puts their hand to the plow and looks back. They just got second thoughts. They said, that, that person is not fit for the kingdom of God. And we need to be people that are not afraid to witness. We're not afraid to take a stand for the Lord. I know when you go to work, you're on your boss's time, but that doesn't mean you can't ever speak up for the Lord. And again, you, you can't be standing around when you're supposed to be working and, and talking about the Lord and all that, but He's the King of kings and the Lord of lords. When we go to our families and they don't like something we believe or whatever, you ought to be able to speak up for the truth. We don't have anything to be ashamed of. It's just like I used to tell my kids when they go to Christian school. Look, this is called a Christian school, but these people are not Christian. They don't have an interest in being holy. They use the name of Christ, but you're going to be different, and you want to be. You don't want to be odd, but you ought to be different from these people that don't take the Bible seriously. We need to fear God and be committed to his work. <coughs> Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this example of Nehemiah and these others who had great sacrifice to themselves, to their families, to their material wealth, to their health. The very lives were in jeopardy. And yet you said they had a, a mind to work. Thank you for people like that. Thank you for people who 
love to be involved in your work and love to see sinners converted and love to see souls grow in their faith. Love to see answer to prayer. We thank you, Lord, that you're a faithful God. As unfaithful as we are to you, you're never unfaithful to us. We thank you for that. Help us to be like you. Help us to be steadfast and unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.